Welcome to Unit 5, Lecture 2, talking about cell structure. This, is lect this lecture is really going to go into the differences between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells, um, and between the two different eukaryotic cells, which um, was a little brief last time. This might turn out to be a little bit longer, but I am going to try and keep it in the 15-minute time span like I try, like usual. Learning objectives. Explain the role of the cell nucleus. Identify the cellular structures that make and transport proteins and other macromolecules. Distinguish the functions of vacuoles, lysosomes, and the cytoplasm. Compare the roles of the chloroplast and mitochondria. Describe the role of the cell membrane. Eukaryotic cells are basically any organism that isn't bacteria. <laughs> so we have two types. Right, we've got animal cells and plant cells, and you can kind of see in a lot of ways they're very similar. Okay, just a few big differences. The central vacuole, the chloroplasts, the cell wall, okay, and then these centrioles, which we'll get a, a little bit more into later. The nucleus is the control center. This is where most of the directions come from. This gives animal cells and plant cells um, this houses all the DNA, and this tells the cell how to function, what to do, when to do it, control, it, it basically controls everything. It's got a few different pieces. So it's, a, it's got a nuclear envelope, which is basically like a membrane on the outside holding all of the DNA together. It's got the nuclear pores because there is some stuff that goes in and out of the nucleus, not necessarily the DNA, but other things, other molecules. There's the chromatin, which is basically a fancy name for D another name for DNA. This is when it's unwound, okay, and it's doing its job, okay. So this is when the nucleus is just functioning, the cell is just living. And then the nucleolus, which is um, kind of like the special heart of the cell, uh, heart of the nucleus that makes ribosomes and makes ribosomal RNA. It's a special kind of RNA. I uh, don't necessarily have to worry about that, but that's what happens. The big job of the cell okay, is to make proteins. If you remember um, from the beginning of Unit 4 when we talked about all of the different macromolecules, there are eight types of proteins. The eight types of proteins basically boil down into doing every single thing that happens in your body for the most part. Um, and so the big I don't want to say 90%, but a lot of what the cell is doing is making proteins to make things happen or to stop things from happening, to cause your hair to grow, um, to cause your hair to stop growing, to, you know, so it's a lot. <laughs> so there are some basic steps to how proteins get made. And it almost all, not almost, it always starts in the nucleus, okay? The directions come out of the nucleus into the ribosome, um, onto a ribosome. Now ribosomes can either be on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, okay, or in the cytoplasm itself, depending on what kind of ribosome you're talking about or what kind of protein you're making. And these ribosomes can actually float back and forth between these two. But proteins are assembled on a ribosome, okay. If that's all they need to do, they can go off and do their job. But that's not, uh, the majority of them, that's not what happens, okay? The next step is they go to the Golgi apparatus, all right? So they leave the ribosome right, and are carried to the Golgi apparatus in a transport vesicle. The Golgi apparatus is a lot like um, UPS, okay? It takes the rough draft and then finalizes it, uh, folds it, adds a few more molecules, puts some tags on it, like GPS tags to tell it where to go in the cell or where to go in the body or whatever. Okay. The Golgi apparatus sorts, um, folds the protein, like I said, finishes it up, it's processing it, to the last thing where it's shipped to their final destination. Some of them are gonna go out of the cell some of them are going to go into the cell to do some sort of job. But that's the main, um, like I said, most of what your cells are doing is building proteins to make things happen. Next comes the vacuole. 
vacuoles, there are, for the most part, vacuoles we associate with plant cells. All right, animal cells have vacuoles, but they're usually a lot smaller, mostly because animal cells aren't storing anything. Um, central vacuoles in plant cells are used for storage, okay? Whereas other vacuoles in animal cells can be used for storage or this special contractile vacuole, which is basically a water cannon. It takes excess water and then um, it stores it for a little while and then spits it out. Um, usually find this in freshwater protists. Okay, and what they can do is they can actually, because what it does is if they have too much water, it'll end up causing them to explode, uh, to burst, which you'll see in the next lecture. Um, but yeah, so without that contractile vacuole, um, the water ends up staying there and ends up, um, would cause problems for the cell. Whereas the plant cell actually wants to store that water, all right, whereas animal cells don't. Cytoskeleton, exactly what it sells, sounds like, the cell skeleton. Right. That cell skeleton, you can see we've got some here in the green, we've got the yellow, the purple. These are all things that are basically just holding the cell together, okay? Keeping the cell shape, keeping the organelles where they need to be. So there's a few different pieces to the cytoskeleton, but we're not going to necessarily get into those. But the cell skeleton, um, it basically keeps the shape and the structure. Just like your skeleton helps keep your shape and your structure, the cytoskeleton does that as well. Chloroplasts, we've talked about this with photosynthesis. All right. We find them in plant cells. Okay. So the chloroplasts, and when you, we uh, have a chance to look at them under the microscope, you'll see them. Okay. So they basically are found only in plant cells and they go through photosynthesis. Mitochondria, okay, we talked about mitochondria, all right, process of cellular respiration. Big thing, notice they are in both plant and animal cells, okay, they are in both. Plants and animals both do uh, cellular respiration, and you can see in this micrograph here, okay, from a scanning electron microscope, because we're seeing the inside of the cell. All right, you can see the chloroplasts and the mitochondria. All right, so we've got the chloroplasts here, and then you can see these smaller red things are the mitochondria. So if you'll notice, plant cells have both. Because okay, plant cells do cellular respiration. Cellular boundaries. We're going to talk a little bit more about these in the next lecture. Um, and what they do and why they're important, movement and so on and so forth. But there are two main cellular boundaries. One is the cell membrane. All cells have a cell membrane. Okay, all cells have a cell membrane. It's what separates cells from the outside environment because if we don't separate them, there's nothing we can do about that, right? There's nothing. Um, that makes a cell special or different because it's not separated from its environment. So cell membranes are in all cells and they're known as selectively permeable. Selectively permeable. Selectively permeable means basically the cell is the gatekeeper. It gets to decide, decide in quotes, um, what moves in or moves out. And the cell membrane is the thing that does that. So it lets some molecules through the cell membrane, lets some molecules uh, in or out, depending on what they are, but doesn't let everything in or out because it's a barrier, it's a protection. We don't want viruses in if we can avoid that. We don't want bacteria in if we can avoid that. Okay, um, and so that cell membrane is kind of gets to pick. The other boundary is the cell wall. Now you'll only find cell walls in prokaryotic cells or plant cells. And this is basically just to give it a little more support, especially when it comes to a plant cell. Plants, if you think about them, they stand all day. They don't do much, okay? They do a lot, but 
movement wise but they don't have any bones they don't have anything to hold them up so the cell wall kind of acts like walls in a building that actually help hold the roof up so the cell wall does that and you can see these little holes in here that's those are just basically tunnels to allow um, stuff to get to the cell membrane or away from the cell membrane because if that was a completely sealed up wall all right you couldn't get in or out it wouldn't really be helpful so those are kind of like the doors or the windows and they are known as plasmodesmata it's one of my favorite biology words plasmodesmata it's just so much fun to say um, because those are the holes that actually allow them to move in or out or allow other things to move in and out. So they're just kind of like points in the cell wall that allow like a door to happen or a window to happen. Um, so they don't destroy the integrity of the cell wall, but still allow movement through the wall. Okay, cell membranes have a really, really, really specific structure, okay? To function and make that selectively permeable happen. or permeability, I guess you could say, happen. All right, so there's a few different pieces here. So one, the blue area is the outside of the cell, the yellow, orangish area is the inside of the cell. Okay, all of these little things are made up of phospholipids. These are special lipids, okay, fats. They're special lipids that actually basically create the bulk of the membrane. Most of the membrane is made up of these phospholipids. That, so you can see they've got a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. So hydrophilic likes water, hydrophobic doesn't like water. So the hydrophobic tails kind of go together like a sandwich, okay? And they point towards each other because they're both hydrophobic. They don't like water, so they stick to each other, all right? And then the hydrophilic star stuff kind of sticks to the outside where you're going to find the more uh, watery like substances and then what that does is that kind of creates a little maze for um, creates a little maze for things to try and get through so it makes it a little bit harder for certain things to get through the cell membrane and makes it easier for other things then you've got a variety of membrane proteins so you can kind of see this is a membrane protein and they do a lot of different jobs that's a membrane protein Okay, um, they can be tunnels, tubes like this one to let things in or out. They can be, um, they can receive messages that cause changes inside the cell. They can do lots of different things. And then the last piece is carbohydrate chains. These are ID tags. Right? They actually ID the cell. So they say, hey, this cell belongs to Ms. Nowicki or this cell belongs to so-and-so. These are really important for whenever you hear about somebody looking for a quote-unquote match for an organ donation. This is a lot of times what they're talking about because the carbohydrate chains, if they don't match, what happens is that's, a, that's information for your immune system to come after that cell and start attacking it and destroying it. So with organs, if it doesn't match, what happens is your immune system tries to actually destroy the organ um, because it doesn't think it belongs there. All right, so that's what those carbohydrate chains are for. All right, have a great day.